the worst thing that can possibly happen to us has already happened. We've been crucified with Christ outside the gates of Jerusalem. We're in him there. And the best thing that can possibly happen to us has already happened. We're raised from the dead. We're seated at the right hand of the Father. All of the inheritance of the kingdom of God belongs to us through the resurrection of Jesus. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Clarissa Mall, producer of The Bulletin. Today on the show, hosts Russell Moore and Mike Cosper are joined by Tom Nichols, staff writer at The Atlantic, to talk about Donald Trump's pardon promise, his legal woes, and his new product lines. Next, we're discussing the recent terrorist attack in Moscow and its meaning for the West. Finally, Mike and Russell reflect on the 10-year anniversary of the closing of Seattle's Mars Hill Church, former pastor Mark Driscoll's new statement of innocence, and the dangers of nostalgia. First, though, I'm dropping in to talk with our hosts about arguably this week's biggest U.S. news, the tragic bridge collapse in Baltimore. Let's get on to today's show. Hi, Mike. Hi, Russell. It's great to be with you today. Hello. Good to see you, Clarissa. As producer here on the show, I sift through a lot of bad news every week, and I'm often looking for wisdom on how to approach it. I know that our listeners are, too. This past Tuesday at 1.30 in the morning Eastern time, while most of the U.S. was sleeping, a cargo ship collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, causing the bridge to collapse. The Singaporean ship had just begun its long trip to Sri Lanka when it blacked out, lost its power, and rammed into one of the main columns of the bridge. Now, after search and rescue efforts, the Coast Guard transitioned to recovery efforts on Tuesday night. Two people were rescued from the water that day. Two bodies were retrieved on Wednesday. And the remaining four people, all Central American workers doing road construction on the bridge, they were patching potholes, and they're now presumed dead. The water was just too cold, and the bridge was too mangled for anybody to survive. The event has thus far been deemed an accident. Now, in some ways, this event is just another tragic day in the news, but I've got to confess, I watched that video of the bridge collapsing probably four or five times on Tuesday morning with that Baltimore skyline glittering in the background and that slow motion of the ship, whatever angle you were watching that video from, it felt almost cinematic. What were your thoughts as you woke up Tuesday morning to see that footage? I immediately began thinking about my friends in Baltimore and wondering if they were okay. And fortunately, they all were. My immediate thought was that can't be real. It's so dramatic. It's so horrible to watch. And then my next impulse was that I wanted to look away. I didn't want to see the video anymore. It's not that I didn't want to read about it or I was unwilling to or I was going to avoid it or whatever, but I just didn't want to know how bad things were in terms of the lives lost and the death total and all of that. Like I I kept seeing in, in initial reports, the numbers were much, much higher than what they turned out to be. But it was just such a horrifying thing to watch that my impulse was definitely to go, oh man, I don't want to absorb this. I don't want to know anything else. This is awful. Yeah. You know, Walker Percy used to write about how in the part of the world where he and I are from, that when a hurricane would come, that there was a kind of enlivening of people, that a lot of people would be kind of knocked out of everydayness, not because of the devastation of the hurricane, but because they're kind of pouring themselves into preparation and help and recovery and and, and everything else that gives a, a sense of uh, other directedness and, and purpose to life. I'm just not sure that we see that anymore in almost any kind of catastrophe because we're so connected. These things happen so often that we just become callous to them. And also because we know that what comes next after something like this is usually not going to be, hey, how do we rally around together and help? But how do we argue about who's to blame? And that's just a very different reality. I think the other difference, too, is that it's one thing to be a part of a community that's bracing for the storm or or responding to the aftermath. It's another thing to be, you know, 500, 600 miles away going, I'm powerless. Like, I just, all I can do is watch this and think about the loss of life and the, the suffering. Yeah, as I watched the videos, I kept having to remind myself, 
there are people on that bridge. There are people here. News often reduces humanity to statistics now or to a short video clip. And if you are 500 miles away, or, you know, I think about our conversation with David French last week about the Gazan death toll. If you are thinking about the Russian attack, 139 lives lost, 31,000 Ukrainians who have died. How do we humanize these numbers so that they don't become just sensational news blips that kind of float across our screens until we scroll them away because we're overwhelmed? I was thinking about that this week with the year anniversary of the Covenant School shooting here in Nashville, where I live, because I knew people whose kids were there and knew people who had been killed there. And I realized on this anniversary how many of these school shootings just came and went because they were so distant from me. I paid attention to them in the moment, but they didn't linger. And with this one, I look around and say, this is awful. And I I think we do think cinematically that once something is moved out of our attention, it's gone. And that's Mm -hmm. just not the way the world works. I read this morning that the people who died on the bridge were workers. And that I believe at this point they've recovered four bodies and there's still several bodies missing. And that kind of broke my heart all over again. One of my best friends in 2005 died in a crab fishing accident. He was on a boat that capsized and he and the majority of the crew were all lost at sea. Only one survivor, only one or two bodies recovered from it. And so what I've been thinking about all morning after reading that is just thinking about the lack of resolution that comes from a situation like that. You spend all this time going, how on earth could this have happened? Like what was going on? I was thinking about that this morning because I'm thinking about these families of the people who've lost lives. They're asking all of those questions. Those people are also all going to be listening to a flood of conspiracy theories, who's to blame, the politics, the arguments, and all of this gross stuff that comes in the aftermath. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, it makes me think of this thread that began to run through the articles and through the news coverage as I read this week. If it had been rush hour, it could have been a lot worse. 30,000 cars cross that bridge every day in Baltimore. It could have been a lot worse. Still, for those families, like you're saying, who lost somebody that day, this was the worst. This was the worst week. What do you think are the ripple effects of that kind of armchair analysis of framing tragedies in this way where... We've got to quickly explain what the actual problem was and and deduce its solution for ourselves. I think there's a positive side to this story that I hope doesn't get missed, which is that the Baltimore Metro services that shut down the bridge and shut down the traffic when they knew that there was a potential for a crisis, they saved countless lives. Who knows how many? They responded quickly. They responded effectively. They responded efficiently. And so that whole it could have been worse thing is certainly true. And it wasn't worse because an institution that the people of Baltimore relied on did their jobs and protected their citizens. I hope that isn't missed in a time where, you know, we always are are lamenting our broken institutions. This is a reminder, man, we need those institutions to work and we need them to do their jobs. And we should be very grateful when they do and when they're effective. Yeah, and it can be true that something could have been worse, and we should be grateful for the mechanisms that kept it from being worse, while also recognizing that every life lost is a catastrophe and a devastation. You know, we always have the argument about quoting Romans 8.28 to someone who's just lost somebody, and I wouldn't do that, not because I don't believe that Romans 8.28 is true, that God works all things together for the good. It's because if you say that next to the casket at that moment, it sounds to that person like you're saying, eh, you know, this, this, this could have been a lot worse. It, it'll, it'll, God will work it, work it out, which, of course, is not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about it in the context of groaning with the creation. And so I think it's possible to have a sense of gratitude of what would have happened if things hadn't worked the way they did, while at the same time saying there's nothing that can bring those people back for their families and loved ones and communities. Yeah. Yeah. There's a tension that we have to exist in there, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, It's a tension that we're not given very much space in the media pace 
to actually hold, right? Like I've got to disconnect because I've got to move on to the next tragic story. I can't handle the onslaught of bad news all the time. So we are barely given the time to process one tragedy when it drops below the fold and we've got a new headline that we've got to face. And I wonder, as you two look at the headlines each week, how do you yourselves create space to sit with tragedy that you see in the news when the news cycle would pull you forward to the next big headliner? I think there has to be a certain kind of disconnection from the news, the way that we consume it now, which is largely via phone. You just can't be hit with something over and over and over again without being desensitized to it. And that's one of the reasons why I think uh, pulling back and away from things for a while, not in order to, I'm going to cocoon myself in away from reality, but by preparing oneself for reality by deeper attention. Actually, I think somebody is better able, for instance, to pray about the situation in Baltimore without having been hit every two seconds by catastrophe online and who has actually spent a good bit of time in deep attention to the way that Jesus deals with the death of Lazarus, for instance. I think we have to keep that in mind. And sometimes people think if I pull back away from what's going on, I'm out of touch. And that's just not true. The people who are the most in touch with what's going on are the people who also know how to withdraw for a while. I think there's a temperament thing that's important to talk about in a conversation like this as well. I have friends and loved ones who talk to me about the work that I do and will often say things like, man, I don't know how you can immerse yourself in the kinds of stories you do or, you know, even just dealing with the weekly news or whatever. I'm not sure how that is. And the joke response to that is that I say, well, I'm just like very cold and disconnected. But the, <laughs> but the genuine response to it is that there is something temperamentally about me that I do have to live with a certain kind of differentiation between my work and my real life. Obviously, as I've shared, like this struck something with me that was deeply personal and was really hard to watch. I mean, I muted it. I wanted to stop seeing the video in my feed because I just kept seeing it over and over again. But I have a tolerance for the news that enables me to do what I do. And there are people in my life who don't that I love dearly. And they shouldn't do that. Like my news diet would not be healthy for a lot of people yeah. who are wired differently. And I think it's important to talk about that because you can kind of moralize, well, you should really care about everything. You mm -hmm. should stay dialed in. You should l listen to the news and you should do this. Like maybe you shouldn't. Like maybe for the sake of your soul, you need to tune some of that stuff out so that Either it doesn't drag you down or that so you're not, de as you were saying, Russ, you're not desensitized. And when something bad happens to someone who you do love that is in your orbit and is close to you, you're not numb to it. You're able to show up in that moment and love that person as your neighbor, as your friend. My 12-year-old son, Taylor, laughs all the time about, this is dad. Huh. Military sources are saying that unidentified aerial phenomenon are doing things that uh, physics can't explain. They don't know what it is. <laughs> Let's go to bed. <laughs> and, and, so I guess there is something temperamental about that. Yeah. Well, we're recording this on Monday, Thursday. This episode drops on Good Friday. Some folks won't listen to it even until Holy Saturday. And in many ways, this is the Christians' darkest news week, right? It's a week of bad news that we rehearse every year. So in closing... How do you think the promise of Easter and the resurrection, you know, we're not jumping ahead here past the sadness, but how does the promise of Easter inform the way that we face the stream of bad news that seems to just continually arrive at our doorstep every morning? I've come in recent years to have a really deep appreciation for Holy Saturday, for its symbolic meaning, because Holy Saturday was this encounter for the disciples, for the people who were closest to Jesus. It was this experience of the absence of God, the experience of the absence of the comfort of Jesus' presence. And of course, God was not absent, right? God in his providence was still at work in profound and beautiful ways, mysterious ways. And yet I think it's so important for us to pay attention to that because we all have, and if we haven't yet, we will have experiences, we will have seasons in our lives where we feel like God is absent, where we experience God as silent. We experience that sort of coldness of, 
I'm crying out to God. My dreams and fantasies and the things that I was expecting have all sort of fallen apart around me. What I see is death and darkness. You know, Psalm 88, darkness is my only friend. Darkness is my only comfort, one translation says. And that is part of the Christian life. It's not the whole of it. And that's why we have Easter. But it is a part of it. And you can't shortcut it either for yourself or for others. You can't push people through it to the other side at a pace faster than they're ready and that God is ready to bring them through it. And so paying attention to that element of the story of this strange providential silence from God is a really important thing, particularly when someone is in or when someone's loved ones are in a season of deep suffering. Psychologists tell us that one of the most effective ways to get through life is actually not positive thinking, but a very low expectations so that a person can imagine what's the worst case scenario here and anything short of that is uh, is good. I think when it comes to who we are in Christ, the worst thing that can possibly happen to us has already happened. We've been crucified with Christ outside the gates of Jerusalem. We're in him there. And the best thing that can possibly happen to us has already happened. We're raised from the dead. We're seated at the right hand of the Father. All of the inheritance of the kingdom of God belongs to us through the resurrection of Jesus. I think we hold those things together. And there's a sense in which a friend of mine who had been going through very difficult cancer lately said, it's amazing how the minute that I received my cancer diagnosis, all of these little things that I was worried about, they all just seem to dissipate. And I think that's right. If we remember who we are as people who belong to the crucified Christ, we have a sense of reprioritization about the things that we carry as what could be the worst possible thing that could happen to me. Russell, Mike, thanks so much. We've got a great show ahead, but thanks for helping us to interact with the news in a way that reflects the beauty and wisdom and comfort of the gospel. We will be right back. Joining us now is Tom Nichols. Tom is a staff writer at The Atlantic and the author of The Atlantic Daily Newsletter. He's also Professor Emeritus of National Security at the U.S. Naval War College. Tom, welcome back to The Bulletin. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Former President Donald Trump has been talking a lot in the last few weeks about the January 6th rioters. He plays a version of the national anthem performed by them at his rallies. He's been referring to them as hostages, promising to pardon them. One of the ways it strikes me as significant is simply the fact that Trump is talking about this. I find it surprising that he would want to make January 6th part of the campaign rather than sort of pretend that it doesn't happen. But he seems interested in making it an animating feature of the rallies, of the support. What do we think is implied by him promising to pardon these rioters? And what does that do to his supporters? You know, I think he does it for two reasons. First, he can't resist the idea of creating a kind of battalion of utterly loyal people who owe their freedom to Donald Trump. I think some of those folks, if he lets them out, are going to just go home and say that they don't ever want to be involved in anything like that again. But I think he's counting on some of them saying, I was willing to do violence for you once, I'll do it again. Then because he's such a narcissist, anyone who sings to him from prison, he's in love with someone like that right away. That makes every narcissistic hair on his body stand on end. But I also think it's part of his campaign of fear because by talking about the people, he's not talking about January 6th, you notice. He's talking about the people who were in jail for January 6th. And that's part of the whole fear mongering of if they can do it to me, they can do it to you. If they can do it to these ordinary Americans, they can do it to you, which of course is true. If you go to the Capitol and you attack a police officer, yes, it can happen to you. It's amazing that anyone who breaks the law can end up under sanctioned by the rule of law. Trump actually wants to make that sound unusual. Trump wants to make that sound really threatening. If you go and rob a bank, they could throw you into jail too, you know, like (laughs) as though you're supposed to go, when did the federal government become so powerful and so woke and crazy throwing bank robbers into jail? So he's kind of normalizing it by trying to make everyone afraid of it. But I also think he's trying to build a kind of loyal cadre 
of people who were involved with January 6th because he might call him to do it again. Republican strategists keep telling Trump, broaden the coalition, right? Broaden the base, hit all the stuff that really freaks out the independents and all that stuff. But Trump and Bannon in 2016 didn't win by broadening the base. They did it by squeezing turnout out of the last angry white males that they could find who weren't voting. And I think that's just Trump's playbook, which is to energize the base and squeeze as much turnout as he can out of a shrinking base. Yeah, as you say that, I'm reminded of George Bluth from Arrested Development, who said, I might have gotten involved in some light treason. I may have committed <laughs> some light treason. Yeah, you know. Russ, you had a great newsletter last week talking about the decline of character, the, the disappearance of character from the calculus that... Christian voters in particular even are making about who they're going to support and who they're going to get behind. And you had this great contrast between Ned Flanders of 25 years ago and Donald Trump today. How are we even talking about normalizing something like this? I'm sure you've asked yourself this question many times. <laughs> How do you answer that question? Well, I think if you look at the Ned Flanders example, there were many evangelical Christians who were saying back then, oh, they're making fun of us. And of course they were. But the question is, what were they making fun of? And why did it work? I mean, humor can only work if it has a little bit of truth to it. So they're making fun of this character who's overly morally scrupulous, too devoted to his wife and family creepily, neighborly, all of those kinds of things. Who would dream of making fun of evangelical Christians that way now? It would be completely nonsensical. And the question is why? And that has everything to do with the kind of public witness that we're putting forward. And it's not just that there's been an alliance of evangelical Christians with a coarse, vulgar, violent sort of movement. It's that that has happened to evangelical Christianity. That's what's being put forward as Christian. And so the confusion is really deep. And I think that the kind of calculus that people have made for so long well, character matters, but the stakes are so high, it's okay to renegotiate uh, the difference between character and what we want in terms of policy goals. This is the end result. The rallies, the creepiness, just the culty creepiness of a revised national anthem with people who have beaten up police officers with American flags in prison for attacking the capital of the United States in order to attempt to overturn an election, singing the national anthem. How is this not alarming to people? We've become too numb. One of the things I've found myself wondering in recent weeks is, is it just simply a symptom of sort of decadence and malaise? Like, Americans have had it so good for so long. We've had a peaceful of transfer of power. Sing my song, we, man. <laughs> I was yeah, going to say, we, Tom. <laughs> we've had this peaceful of transfer of power for the history of our nation. We won the Cold War. We had 9-11, but post 9-11, there wasn't another major attack on American soil. Like, life has been pretty darn good and stable for Americans for a very, very long time. And so we zero in on political issues that genuinely matter. But we then say they matter so much that I'm going to count on history repeating itself and everything working out okay in spite of all the red flags and warning signs because I just really hate the other side so much. Is that, Tom, is that what we're thinking? Mike, you know, the, the thing about decadence, I'm not the first guy to think of it. Eric Hoffer, back in 1951, when he was talking about how authoritarian movements and these kind of dangerous mass movements arise, he pointed out that one of the most dangerous conditions in a society is the presence of broad and unrelieved boredom. And we've now reached a point of kind of post-materialist politics. This isn't 1964, where we're trying to figure out how to get running water and paved roads around America. I mean, we had these huge challenges, right, that we were going to try and end childhood diseases and somehow make a dent against poverty. We were going to put a man on the moon. We were going to beat the communists in the Cold War. We were going to try and win this bloodbath in Vietnam that caused all of this social change. We've had 30, 40 years of people now obsessing over the narcissism of small differences with uh, the, the star-bellied sneeches and people who part their hair on the right. But I think that needed 
people to monetize it and weaponize it. And that's one of the things that's happened, particularly within the Republican Party and with Trump. And and I'll just say that, you know, I am not an evangelical. It's always interesting for me to come here and talk with you guys because I'm Greek Orthodox. So I come from this old world smells and bells tradition that is very far removed from the American evangelical tradition. But I think we're all reacting in the same way to what I think for most Christians is in effect a heresy of placing the state above God, of using Jesus as a prop for politics, embossing American flags on Bibles and putting Lee Greenwood lyrics next to the Decalogue. I mean, it's insane. I think it's an insanity that is easily recognized by Christians who go, you know, all the way back to the stovepipe hat guys on my side to, you know, the evangelical movement of the new world here. But it is a heresy. And it's, I find it kind of horrifying and horrifying in part, to go back to your point, Mike, because it comes out of this kind of decadent boredom and high living standards. You know, it costs a lot of money. I I actually went into a let's go Brandon store. Here and there was one. We actually there, there's had. an actual Let's Go oh, Brandon store. I I, oh. I regret Dr. Moore to be the bearer of this news, but there are many of them, and <laughs> and that's all they sell is you know Trump stuff and Let's Go Brandon stickers and flags and all that stuff. And we had one here for a while. It has since closed. Amazingly, not a big market in New England, but it's expensive to be a Trumper. It costs money. It's not cheap. And I think that's part of the problem. We've gone to this kind of post-materialist politics of let's argue about, as you put it, Mike, important things, but very narrow things that shouldn't divide us as much as they do, because we've always been able to have these conversations among each other as Americans, and now we can't. I think that's exactly right. Part of what's so remarkable about the Trump thing as well is that there's not a coherent ideology. It's not as if he's saying, this is what matters. This is a way of seeing the world and thinking the world. It's kind of whatever the whim is, because there's nothing coherent about his thinking. It's truly wrapped up in him. And yet people are so drawn to ultimately this sense of grievance, this sense of entitlement. They latch into that and say, it matters so much that I'm willing to go, yeah, okay, like peaceful transfer of power, dictator for a day, even the bloodbath comment, which to be clear, so Trump made this comment about the auto industry is gonna be a bloodbath. He was talking about the auto industry, we can stipulate that. But a man who fomented a violent insurrection at our capital to prevent the peaceful transfer of power, talking about a bloodbath, like, dude, irresponsible rhetoric. I don't care if you're talking about the auto industry. And yet people are willing to go, oh, he's just talking about cars, man. He's just talking about cars. Like, I'm really mad about this woke kindergarten in San Francisco that I will never go to and neither will any of my loved ones. That's enough for me to vote this way and jeopardize everything else about the stability of our country. It, it blows my mind. And part of it, Mike, I mean, uh, Tom mentioned the God bless the USA Bible. I <laughs> We were just about to get there. <laughs> I, I, I'm sitting here uh, thinking this week, if I had said in 2015 or 2016, there will come a day where he will be hawking y'all copies of the Bible that he has endorsed personally for $60 no one would have believed it. It would have sounded absolutely deranged. And I look at this right now and say, on the one hand, I guess it's kind of good for him to have a Bible and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence all together in one book so he can flip it open to any page, violate whatever is there. Uh, I guess we should be grateful for that. But on the other hand, I just wonder how much of the things that I love is this guy going to colonize my faith, the word of God, politics, country music. I mean, uh, all of these things that, that this guy is now occupying, it's astounding. And it's more astounding to me, though, that you do not have people saying, you know what, you really can't take the things that matter this much the word of God breathed out by the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't do that and try to build a brand and make money off of it. But that's not what's happening right now. Think about what we were just saying. You know, again, the gospels, the word of God 
endorsed by Donald Trump. Well, there's a blurb that the Lord has been waiting 2,000 years for. It's like, no, no, I know you people think the Bible's cool, but this one is endorsed by me. The only one endorsed by him. The only one, yes. I mean, it's just astonishing. And again, I think you're right. If In 2015, I think if even he had tried it in 2015, people would have recalled from it. He had to move the Overton window. But one other element of, of the Trump story from this week brings up this other point. Trump has nine lives times nine at this point. He's in these terrible financial straits. He can't pay the bond to make this appeal for for these crimes in the state of New York. He gets the rate lowered, but he's still probably going to have a hard time coming up with the cash to do it. And then Truth Social goes public this week. And on, on its first day, it becomes a meme stock and gets a valuation of $8 billion. He obviously doesn't have all $8 billion of it, but he has a few billion of that he owns. It would take a complicated mechanism for Trump to get access to that money anytime soon, but he's probably going to be able to do it because that board is very beholden to him. He's probably going to be able to at least get a loan against it or something like that, almost certainly for the $140 million. The guy has nine lives. Nothing sticks to him, and he seems to be able to sort of wriggle his way out of, out of anything. Why does that keep happening? In part, it happens because our legal and judicial and constitutional mechanisms were never designed to deal with a rogue president. People on the left are constantly waiting for the courts to save them or a judge to save them or Jack Smith or a prosecutor or some white knight on a horse to ride in and finally, kind of like St. George, finally slay this dragon. And it's not going to happen because our system isn't built that way. Our system, if you go all the way back to the people like James Madison and John Adams, who who I think, you know, isn't quoted at my Massachusetts heritage demands that I speak up for Mr. Adams, who doesn't isn't quoted enough on this. But both of them said, basically, if we are not a virtuous people, then nothing will matter, then none of these mechanisms will work. Because the thing that would have brought accountability to somebody like Donald Trump in an earlier time is the inherent decency of the American people. And when you have half the country, at least, and this is, again, why Russ's Ned Flanders piece was so on the nose, when you have millions of people who have decided that decency is for chumps and that there is this kind of aspirational jerkitude that instead captures people who who can't get out of this sort of adolescent stage of development, then Donald Trump can survive and get reelected president because then we're just another banana republic. And and all of the brilliant mechanisms that our founders created won't work because they were predicated on a different kind of public sentiment. And I think people just don't understand that the law is not going to be an answer here. The law functions, the Constitution functions by agreement, not by enforcement. Yeah. And it's not just on the left that you have this kind of thinking. I will often be talking to Christians who are not swept up in any sort of cultic political movement of of any kind, but who just are really uncomfortable with all of this awful stuff and polarization. And they'll often say, well, can you give us any hope? And I'll say, well, it depends on what you mean. If what you mean by that is the the biblical virtue of hope, that we hope for what we do not see, and ultimately the promises Jesus makes at Caesarea Philippi come about, then yeah, I can give you that. But what most people mean when they say hope right now is, well, something will happen. There'll just be something that will just cause all of this to eventually go away so we don't have to think about it right now. That kind of hope I can't give you because that requires a people who are willing to say we're going to face what's going on and we're going to bear the consequences of saying this isn't normal and that costs something. The ability to bear the consequences of maturity And I don't mean age, but I mean the consequences of a kind of a stoicism and civic virtue. I think the loss of that really says a lot. You know, Mike, I was struck when you were saying that when you talk to these folks, there's no program. And I remember back in 2016 saying to people, "Okay, you won. My approach to I didn't want Trump, but you won. I I refer to him as Mr. President. He's president of the United States. What do you want? In eight years, I never got an answer to that question that amounted to more than just a kind of an 
you know, I just want to make you mad or I want to shake things up or I just want other people to be unhappy. Again, when you talk about civic virtue and all you're doing is voting to see if you can, you know, like out of the corner of your eye to see if the guy in the next voting booth is mad at you is really childish. It's really a kind of childlike anger where I think a lot of these folks are just displacing anger they have about things in their lives. They're looking for somebody to blame, but there's no program there. To me, that's what defeats any kind of rational discussion about this when it comes to hope, that something will happen. I always think of the character from uh, David Copperfield says, well, something will turn up. All right. Well, on that hopeful note. (laughs) (laughs) Something will happen, Mike. Something will happen. We will be right back. Last Friday, at least 139 people were killed when terrorists attacked Moscow's Crocus City Hall music venue. Russia is currently blaming the Ukrainians, but also blaming the U.S., and as of today, apparently blaming the U.K. Tom, can you tell us a bit about what has taken place here and what we're seeing from the Russians? Why are they responding the way they're responding? ISIS took credit for the attack almost immediately. What is Russia's game? What is in it for them to blame the Ukrainians and the U.S. and the U.K. in the midst of this? Putin's trying to escape the humiliation of having this happen right after he's been reelected. And I'm using Dr. Evil air quotes here, you know, reelected. But (laughs) he needs to find somebody to blame because what apparently has happened, supposedly this came from ISIS-K, the Khorasan region offshoot of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who then joined up with Islamic State, and they're pretty bad boys. And so they made their way into Russia. Apparently, these guys are Tajiks, which is a neighboring but far away former Soviet Republic. And they got in and just started shooting the place up. The United States actually had some intelligence chatter that it was picking up on about this. And under a tradition in international diplomacy called the duty to warn, even if you you know don't have very good relations with another country, if they're about to get hit with a terror attack, you pick up the phone and you say, listen, I, I know we're not pals here, but we feel the need to tell you that this thing could happen. And we did that. We picked up the phone and we called the Russians and the Russians just missed the signs. And this terrible thing happened. So now Putin has to explain his way out of this. Well, it was the Americans and no, it was the Brits. And well, it was the Ukrainians who helped smuggle these guys in and then was going to smuggle them back out. And, you know, because he can't stand before the Russians and say, I am slaughtering your sons en masse in Ukraine to fight Ukrainian Nazis Meanwhile, leaving us uncovered here just in a suburb of Moscow to get wiped out by Islamists. This is an old Soviet playbook. Oh, somebody, the imperialists, they'll blame everybody now. They've tried to blame the Ukrainians, the Brits, the Americans, but that's because they don't want anybody to blame Vladimir Putin. Do we have any evidence that this is actually being believed by the Russian people? I haven't seen any because, as you can imagine, polling in Russia is a rather fraught exercise. There is some anecdotal evidence that Russians are pretty cynical consumers of news, to be honest. So when Putin says, well, this was the Brits, it was the Ukrainians, it was this, it was that, and then on TV, he shows you these four very Caucasus-looking guys who don't look British or they look like ethnic Central Asian guys. And Putin is saying, yes, we also know that it was Islamic extremism. Then I think the average Russian gets it. Like, okay, we got hit by Islamic extremists and the president's now got to spin his way out of this. Because remember, people are always amazed when I say this, but since 9-11, the Russians have actually endured more mass casualty attacks from Islamic extremists than we have. We had the big showstopper in 2001, and then very small scale. I mean, if you want to count, for example, San Bernardino is Islamic terrorism, maybe. But the Russians have had, you know, hospitals and theaters and the subways, and they've had a lot of these attacks. So it's not like it's a big shock 
to find out that Islamic State is back in Russia. They've had attacks from the Chechens. They've had attacks from people in Central Asia and from people in the Middle East. The Islamic extremists don't love Russia any more than they love the United States. The grievance from the Islamic extremists towards the U.S., Great Britain, like sort of traditional Western powers, that stuff's pretty familiar, I think, probably to most listeners. What's the grievance with Russia? Well, first of all, the Russians have been conducting a war in Chechnya for a long time. And the Chechen war was the source of a lot of this grievance in the Islamic world. The old Soviet Union wasn't a great place to be a Muslim. Although the worst place to be a Muslim was actually after the fall of the Soviet Union, when things get dicey between Russia and the republics, in part because of Chechnya. And then the Russians decided to make a play for the Middle East, and their troops start showing up in Syria and start killing a lot of ISIS guys. This grudge between Islamic extremists and a certain subset of Muslims in places like Chechnya, this goes back a ways. This is a blood feud that didn't start yesterday. Do you think we're seeing something that's going to be an isolated incident, or is this something where we expect additional attacks other places, other countries? What's your sense of that? That's a good question. Always a dangerous thing to prognosticate, right? Because you say, no, I, no, we're fine, and then you know the next uh, attack happens tomorrow. But I don't think so for two reasons. First, this seems very much like a plot brewed up in Central Asia using these Tajik attackers. So that doesn't seem to me to be a natural part of a series of attacks. It looks like a one and done. I hope I'm right. I could be wrong. The second reason is a big showstopper attack like this burns a lot of capital, and it burns a lot of human capital. As we used to darkly joke in counterterrorism discussions after 2001, suicide terrorism is labor intensive. But so is attacking a big air arena and then getting caught. So these showstopper attacks, they burn a lot of capital in terms of money, training, people. So there tend to be longer lags between them because it exposes your networks. I mean, those guys look like they've had the crap beaten out of them already. And so the Russians are going to find out a lot of stuff. And that, and again, that's a cost. That's a sunk cost that's now just going to get burned now that they've got these guys. So I don't think so. And I hope I'm right. But there's always the caveat there that with terrorists in the shadows, you never know. Tom, as, as an Orthodox Christian, what do you think is going to happen with the Russian Orthodox Church? I mean, there are, God bless the KGB Bibles, essentially uh, being sold in Russia from certain religious allies with Putinism in the Russian Orthodox Church. And part of this has been an attempt to turn the war against Ukraine into a holy war. We've seen that with Putinist allies saying it's against the decadent uh, West. Does this kind of thing strengthen that hand of making this a religious ideological crusade as well as a political one? I don't think so, in part because the Russian church, which is now just basically an arm of the Russian government, their patriarchs got a pretty dodgy background. Pains me to say that, but I'm part of the Orthodox world that is not in communion with the Russians right now. So... I don't think that the Islamic attack will somehow paper that over. And I don't think that the holy war approach has been that successful because the Russians are culturally attached to the Orthodox Church, but they're not that religious of people. I mean, the Orthodox in America attend church more than Russians do in Russia. You know, of course, that's probably true. I I think someone told me that was true about my folks, the Greeks, that Orthodox Americans tend to go to church more than than the Greeks do because, you know, it's a state religion and people get used to it. So I think this isn't going to help Putin with the Holy War thing, in part because he just has not been able to come up with a coherent narrative. People think Putin is this brilliant chess player. And he's really not. He's a gangster. He improvises. He did in this crisis what he's done in every other crisis in his regime. He went to ground for a day and disappeared. You know, he's not the guy who comes out five minutes later, like an American president, and says, I'm on the scene. We're in touch. I've talked to the governor. Putin just vanishes for a day. So I don't think this is going to help them. The only person that's really bought into this holy war stuff is Putin. And I don't think anybody else has really been buying. What are the implications for the Ukraine war from this? Will this have any larger effect on that campaign and the public sentiment around it in Russia? So I think the question that pops into the mind of the average Russian is, you're drafting my son to go kill 
basically people that we think of as family in Ukraine. And meanwhile, my daughter can't go to a rock concert without getting slaughtered by Tajiks working for the Islamic State. Remember, part of the deal that authoritarians make with their people is competence. You're not free, but you're taken care of. When I would first go to the former Soviet Union, I went to the Soviet Union four times, and then I went many times to the new Russia afterwards. And then the people that were nostalgic for the Soviet Union said, listen, we had enough bread, we had enough sausage, we had enough vodka, and we were basically safe. And that's the deal they would take again. And Putin basically said, okay, I can make you that deal. And now that deal's been broken repeatedly, not just not just last week. Remember, Putin comes to power because of some bombings that we now think he may have been involved with in 1999. I don't think, by the way, that this is a false flag. I know there was a lot of chatter about that on social media, and people love that term because it makes life more interesting and it makes it more like a movie. But I don't think Putin would have set up a false flag operation where he would then have to go to ground for almost 24 hours and then come out looking like an idiot at the end of it. If it were a false flag, these guys would not have all been Tajiks and they would have been confessing about holding up the guns they got in Kiev and all that stuff. I, I just don't I don't see it. I know it's a theory that's out there. I just don't buy it. Well, Tom Nichols, informative as ever. Thanks so much for making some time to join us once again this week. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This week, I texted Mike and said, here's something you have to talk about this week. As the writer and host of The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, one of the things that's tended to stick with people's uh, memories is the screaming of Mark Driscoll, the pastor about whom that uh, documentary series featured, yelling, uh, how dare you, who do you think you are, so forth. And this week, uh, Mark Driscoll gave an explanation as to what he was doing there. And oddly enough, it's one that portrays him as a heroic figure in all of this. Mike, when you heard that explanation, did you think, okay, I need to go back and redo Rise and Fall of Mars Hill? (laughs) I can say with 100% honesty, that thought literally never once crossed my mind. How dare you? (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. You know, it's it's a remarkable video, and you were not the first to send it to me. I mean, I got it from quite a few different people, and it probably took getting eight to ten texts about it before I actually decided to watch it. It was kind of like, all right, do I really want to open this can of worms and revisit this whole story again? What I didn't realize was I was not prepared for what was on the video. It's a really remarkable video because of how revisionist of history and and of reality it really is. And this video, this is his most famous outburst. He's screaming at the young men of Mars Hill. He's yelling at them, you know, essentially for sleeping with their girlfriends and then daring to come to church and take communion. And, And he says, how dare you? Who in the hell do you think you are? When the sermon first came out, this video went viral. The whole thing was made for television. It was planned well in advance that the sermon was going to sort of climax in this confrontation with these young men. He would preach, you know, five, six services on a Sunday. And then the video team would edit that into a single thing that would then be sent out to the other churches to watch the following week and to release online the following week and all the rest. But he's arguing, Mike, that that this was a spontaneous reaction to certain things that had happened that morning. Right. Well, that morning and and in the days prior, one of the things he says in this video is that part of the reason he was so worked up was because he was hearing these stories of young men taking advantage of women at Mars Hill. He was praying with people after the service and meeting with them and hearing from them. By this time in the life of the church, Driscoll had offices kind of across the street, essentially, from the sanctuary. He was escorted into the building through a back door right before he went on stage and then escorted away from the stage by armed bodyguards immediately after the sermon while the service was still continuing. So the idea that he was down front all day praying with people in the church, maybe on that day he broke protocol and he did that. No one had ever told that version of the story before because I did a lot of reporting on this for the podcast. 
But it would have been wildly out of character for him to be doing that. He just didn't do that. He left that to the local leaders. The second thing that's interesting about it is that this sermon happens the same year that Real Marriage came out. If you read the account that he lays out in Real Marriage of Grace's story, he doesn't use any of the language that he uses in the video. In fact, Heath Lambert wrote a review of Real Marriage for the Journal for the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. That's a remarkable piece of writing, reviewing the book. Lambert essentially says, this is a really irresponsible way to talk about your wife's sexual experiences, sexual traumas, sexual background, because you're essentially blaming her for everything that happened wrong in your marriage. Again, we talk about this in much more detail in the podcast, but it's important, I think, to point it out because Mark is talking now about Grace's background and story and experience in a way that is dramatically different than the way he was talking about it at the time and in the years immediately after this story that he tells on this video. Like you said, it's a video that turns him into the hero, but the number of falsehoods and things that just don't stack up with other testimony about that day and that sermon is pretty significant, like remarkably significant. It's a bold story. I'll just say that. You know, the first thing I thought about when I saw it were the people, many of them that you interviewed on Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And I thought, what must all of the people who lived through that, whether they lived through it close up or whether they were people in Seattle who sort of looked at the Mars Hill debacle and said, I I don't want anything to do with the church after this. What must they think when they see this? We shared the story of a Mars Hill member who had gone to Mark and shared her own sexual trauma and had had a really important encounter with God through counseling with him. She was a leader in the church. She was really involved and then had gone through some difficulties in the church. And then at some point she got a letter in the mail from him about her story and her experience while she was in this place where things were really difficult. And she gets this letter and it was profoundly meaningful to her at the time because it just really spoke to what was kind of broken in her and broken in the church. And it helped her to kind of reconcile. Then, a few months later, a book came out in which that letter was a chapter in the book. (laughs) She was not aware that the letter was going to be a chapter in the book. He had changed her name. But it was her story. And then all of a sudden it made sense. Like, he was sending me the letter now because he didn't want me to read it in the book without having actually gotten the letter from me in the first place. So as he tells this story of this young woman at the end of this video, I kept thinking of her and her story and this sort of utilitarian way of taking people's suffering. Like even if this girl's story is true and took place, to use it now as a way to prop him up as a hero and to sort of rebrand this sermon that he was once very proud of, I think it's really gross. And there's an aspect of it that's like, Mark was saying, guys, remember how great it used to be? Remember how fun it used to be? Like, don't you just want to go back there to some extent? Like, don't you want to get the band back together and like play some of the old hits? There's a nostalgia piece to it. And part of what's sad about it is that like, Marcel was deeply meaningful for lots and lots of people. And that sermon, like I I also heard from people who that sermon was life-changing for them. That's all very legitimate. What I highly doubt is that there's very many people who were part of Mars Hill who are seeing Mark trot out the greatest hits and saying, yeah, let's just go back because they've experienced what comes along with that. And I think they've had enough. Yeah. And I get that pulled in nostalgia. Uh, I think of the um, Toby Keith song, I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Yeah. That's a powerful feeling for people, especially when they look back and say it's complicated to have seen God working through the grace of God and also looking around and saying, wait, a lot of this wasn't what it seemed. It's hard to hold those two things together. I keep going back to Mark and I keep thinking like, here's somebody who truly does have a gift with words and had a way at his best moments connecting to Christians who felt displaced, who weren't going to go darken the door of the other churches in their city and had found a home and had found a community there. And like here he is a decade later, there'll be 10 years in October from his removal. Here he is a decade later, essentially trying to replay the hits rather than doing what wisdom would do, which would be to say, and what did I get wrong? Who did I hurt? How do I reconcile those things and try and do something constructive and healing from here? 
it's sad because I think about that and I think, man, with the mind and the rhetorical gifts and the, the humor gifts, the communication gifts, whatever you want to call it, all that he has under the engine, so to speak, to continue to sort of employ them the way he has in this self-defensive way and to try to sort of rewrite history and recreate himself as the hero. It's just sad. It's very sad to me. Well, one thing we do know, despite all of the wreckage around us, is that Christ is risen. Happy Easter to all of you, and we'll see you next week on The Bulletin. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.